All right, I'm preaching on church this morning, the importance of church. The importance of church. Now, what does what is a church? Right? What does the word church mean? You know, a lot of people use this word incorrectly. They, they think it refers to a building. Um, but it's, it's not the building, it is the people. This is what I taught the kids this morning. Um, you see Psalm 22, 22. And this is where we started. I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Right, and now this psalm is quoted in Hebrews 2, Hebrews 2.12, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. And look at what the word congregation is replaced with. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Now, in the Bible, the word church can refer to the assembling, like we are assembled here right now, or it can refer to the people that make up that assembly. 1 Corinthians 14, yet in the church, so this is uh, Paul talking about speaking in the church, I'd rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. So if you're familiar with 1 Corinthians 14, Paul, it's a chapter about you know, the misuse of tongues in the church and people were using the gift of tongues within the church but nobody knew what they were talking about. And he, here he's saying here, when he speaks in the church, so what is he talking about? In the congregation, this group of people. But in 1 Corinthians 14, 23, he also says, if therefore the whole church be come together into one place. So you see how church in the church is when the congregation is gathered, but the people that make up that congregation can also be referred to the church. That's why the church can come together into one place. They're not just the church when they are gathered in together into one place. And all speak with tongues, and they come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers. Will they not say that ye are mad. So, a church is not a building, right? A church is not a building. So, you know, we should correct our children when they, or, you know, correct um, our children when they misuse the word. You know, sometimes my children will drive past you know, down Moorbank Avenue and they'll say, oh, there's, that's where the church is. Well, no, that's where the church's building is. That's where we meet for church. But that's not church. Church is the people, right? So church is not a building. Church also is not a ritual. You know, sometimes if people come from different types of backgrounds and they think of church as like the church, church is when I go to church and I put on my Sunday face and I put on my Sunday clothes and I go and I go through the rituals. I stand up, I sit down, stand up, I sit down. You know, so repeat the verses, repeat after me. You know, there's the back and forth. You know, and they say, well, that's church. Well, that's not church either. You know, you may go through traditions. You may have different activities that you do when you're gathered, when the church is gathered. But that's not church. That's just what the church does. That may be church activities, church ordinances, things like that. Church is the people. Now, what sort of place should the church be? First Timothy 3, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. So you see there, there's a way that we ought to behave in the house of God. Right? So it ought to be a godly place. Right? This is why sometimes people get this impression, you know, you speak to people in the world and they say, oh, shouldn't everyone just be welcome at church? You know, sometimes I get emails, or oh, this person's this sort of person, should, should they be allowed in church or should they be allowed to come to church? But there are some sins that are not allowed at church, which is outlined in 1 Corinthians 5. Why? Because church is meant to be a godly place. It's meant to, it's meant to be a certain type of atmosphere at church. Right? It's not meant to be like the world. So we want a certain sort of culture at church, how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. So it's meant to be a family as well. So that's why we're meant to see each other as family, the body of Jesus Christ, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So it's a pillar of truth as well as the ground of the truth. And the way I always think of that is a pillar is something that holds something up. So that's what the church is meant to be. It's meant to be a place that is upholding the truth, but it's also the ground of truth as well, where people can come and be planted and grow, right? If you think of like a garden, like trees planted in the garden. So it's a place where people can receive spiritual nourishment. So church is important. Church is important in the spiritual life. We're going to talk about four sort of ways that it helps in the spiritual life and why it's important. Okay, but church is the people. Right? It's being part of this group. It's not just being present in this building. 
You know what I mean? That's not what church is. So the first point I want to talk about, the importance of church, is obedience. Obedience. So, yes, we believe salvation is by grace. Salvation does not require works. You know, salvation means you can do no works. You believe on Jesus Christ, you're saved eternally. Salvation is by grace. But that doesn't mean sin is okay. And this is often the, the, dis, the, the distinction that unsaved people can't wrap their head around. They can't wrap their head around why you can be saved without works and yet sin still not be okay. Right? It's because we don't get to heaven by good works. You know, salvation is free. Salvation is, does not require good works. But that doesn't, that's, not a, that's not condoning sin. You know, because the reason why people struggle with this concept is because they're, they're so, it's so ingrained in them their whole life that they must be good in order to get to heaven. Right? That heaven is a reward rather than a gift. That when somebody says, well, if you, go to, you, can, you can be bad and still go to heaven. They just can't wrap their head around it because they think, wait, wait, don't you have to be good? To go to heaven, don't any good people go to heaven? Don't you have to deserve to go to heaven? Well, no, because nobody deserves to go to heaven. Right? That's why salvation is by grace. And that's why when we say, hey, even though you're a sinner, you still go to heaven by grace, we're not condoning sin. We're not saying, therefore, it's okay to sin. Therefore, it's okay to just spit in God's face every day. Hey, even if you did and you believed on Jesus Christ, would you still be saved? Yes. But does that mean it's okay to sin? No, that does not mean it's okay. So, we need to distinguish between those. The easiest way to distinguish is just to think about it like a father-child relationship, like a, like a parent-child relationship. When the child is naughty, that doesn't, stop, that doesn't mean the child is no longer your child. Right? That's why the, the, the child and, and parent relationship is a good analogy of salvation, because no matter how the, the child behaves, the child and the father or the parent it still has that relationship. And it's the same with salvation. God is still our Heavenly Father, even though we misbehave as Christians. But misbehaving is not okay. It's not a good thing to do. So you may be saved, but are you a good ambassador of Jesus Christ? You know, are you a good representation of Christianity in this world? You know, when people look at you, do they, do they see a picture of a good Christian? Or do they, do they, they can't tell the difference? You know, they can't tell the difference. They should be able to tell the difference. Hebrews 10, 24. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. See, in our church here, we meet once a week. And you should be here once a week. Right? Once a week is a good, I think it's a good um, sort of, uh, you know, routine to get into, get good habit to get into, that you come to church once a week. You know, I think God creates days and weeks and months and years, right, so that we have, you know, this cycle that we can repeat and remind ourselves, because we're very forgetful. So we meet here once a week. You should strive to be here. Don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Be in church. And, you know, church is not optional, right? This is why I'm saying, like, church is a command of God to, to to, to assemble together. So that's why it's something that we must do in order to remain obedient to God. Now, having a good conscience before God, it's, it's an under, underrated thing. So why is church important and why you being in church is important? Because, you know, when you're in church and you're doing the things that God wants you to do, you have a pure conscience before God. You know, and, and it's an underrated thing. You know, when you, when you walk in the Spirit, and you're not walking in the flesh, then you experience the things of the Spirit. Look at Galatians 5, verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. See, the believer has this internal struggle within himself, or within herself, because you, there's the good that the Spirit wants to do, and then there's the bad that the flesh wants to do. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance. So some of these things you experience when you walk in the flesh, right? You know, you, you struggle with the old man's lusts. 
right? Idolatry, putting God and other things first before God. Witchcraft, hatred, variance. You know, you can you know, struggle to overcome hatred. You know, variance and emulations is like you know, being fake, right? Wrath, right? Anger, strife. This is uh, like arguments, seditions, heresies. These, these are wrong beliefs. Envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and the such like. So this is not an exhaustive list. This is why the Bible says in the such like. But these are the sort of things you experience and your thoughts when you know, you're walking in the flesh. You know, this is why you, know, you don't want to understate walking in the Spirit and having a good conscience before God. There's a burden that is lifted you know, when you're doing the right things. You know, when, you're, when, you're, when you're living a way that you know is not right. There's this burden that you carry. There's this constant guilt that you carry. I always think about it like when, when couples date, right? They're not married. Right? They're dating, they're dating for years and years, and you know, they're, they're doing all the stuff that married people do, and, 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 and uh, a dating couple should not be doing. And there's this constant burden. And I tell like, couples that are dating, they, they're about to get married, and I try and encourage them to stay pure. And I tell them, you know, once you get married, you'll, you'll realize what I'm talking about, that this, that this burden, this guilt is just lifted. Because now that you're living a life that's pleasing to God. And the same happens, you know, with fornication. But the same happens just in your, in your spiritual life. Like if you're not reading your Bible, you know, you're day by day, you, you've got this burden just hanging over you, telling you, like you should be reading it. You should be spending time in God's Word. You should be spending time in prayer. It's the same when you don't go to church. You know, you live your life day by day and you think it's all right, but then you've just got this burden hanging over you. Like, I should be in church. I should be there with God's people. I should be praising God. I should be part of the body. So that's an underrated, underrated thing, to have a good conscience before God. Because look at the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. Look at this. Peace. Peace. Long-suffering. Gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So oftentimes in people's life, the, the heavy burden, you know, or maybe even depression can start creeping into your life. It's because you're not walking in the Spirit. And one of the important things is to be in church. So God's commands are not only there just to burden your life. You know, God's commands are there because He knows what's best for you. And if you walk in the Spirit, you keep those commandments, you're in church, you're walking in the Spirit, then you will also experience the fruit of the Spirit. And one of the fruit is peace. Peace with God as well. So, number one is church is a command, right? It's not optional. You have to be in church, and it's a good thing for you too. And if you are walking in the Spirit, you will experience the fruit of the Spirit. Number two, the importance of church is your example. Your example. Now, sometimes when Christians talk about your example, they call it, you know, your testimony. And I'll say, like, you know, your testimony as a Christian is important. Generally, when people talk about your testimony, they, they, they talk about your example. But I think what your testimony actually, actually is, people talk about your testimony for salvation. That's, that's one thing they talk about. So your testimony is, you know, how you got saved. But people often use this word because a testimony is really just a witness. It's just a, something that you're, a statement that you're making. Uh, a representation. So, your testimony. You know, if you're in church, one, one important thing of being in church is your testimony to, to the world. You know, are you a faithful Christian? You know, are you in church? You know, what do you do on Sundays? People expect Christians to be in church on Sundays. Other Christians expect Christians to be in church on Sunday. Our children will expect Christians to be in church on Sunday. So, what sort of example are we setting? You know, your example gives your words extra credibility and extra weight. You know, if you want to share your faith with somebody else, you know, the, the sort of strength of your example and your testimony is going to make your words have more weight when you try and share with people. Look at what it says here in 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Right? So this is an a, a, a example to a leader, you know, even a young leader. You know, so I, I reson this resonates with me a lot. 
to say, like, don't let people, you know, despise the fact that you're young, right? But be an example to them. Be a leader to them in word, in conversation, in the way you look, in, the, in what you know, in the way you live, right? In the way you go about things. What's in spirit? I, I think of this as like your attitude, right? The attitude you have. In faith, the things you believe. And in purity, you know, the way you live your life, a clean life, you know, free from, you know, the, the, the dirty things of this world, whether it be drugs or fornication, uh, sexual impurity or fleshly impurity, right? First Peter 5, 2, feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. So this is a great verse to remind us to lead by example. Right? That's why our example is important. If we want to lead our children, we want to lead the next generation, we need to lead them by our example. Don't just tell people they should be in church. You show them. This is what it means to be in church. You know, even when you may travel away somewhere, right? Are you still in church? As an example, to say, hey, even if I try, even I go somewhere else, I still make sure I'm in church somewhere so that I am in, you know, the body of Christ somewhere, you know, singing songs and listening to God's word, no matter where I am. So example is what people see, isn't it? Like your example is what people see. So this is why if we want to be salt and light in the world, we need to have a good example, because that's what people are going to see. Matthew 5.13, ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but onto a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Let your light so shine. What is your light like? Do you ever think about that? Do you ever think, well, what is my light like? You know, when you think, well, what is your light? Well, your light is your example. It's what people see, right? It's how you live. It's how you dress. It's how you speak. What is your social media like? You know, some people on their social media, they have terrible language on their social media. You know, even the way you comment. You know, if you, you comment the way that you talk to people in real life. The, the, what, what people see about us, that is our light. That is our salt. You know, how do you taste? How do you look? These are the things you should think about because we're meant to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ in this world. Right? What sort of example are you setting? And that's one reason why it's important to be in church because it's an example to other Christians. Right? You're setting a good example. And it's an example to the next generation as well. Because example is what our children will copy. You know, they don't always copy what you tell them to do, right? But they'll copy what you do do. That's why sometimes you'll find, you know, sometimes find my kids, they'll be saying, talking the way I'm talking, and reminding, oh gosh, you know, maybe I should uh, not be so harsh, you know, not talk like that. Um, you know, so children, they're like a mirror to you, aren't they? They copy your example. So, you know, what sort of habits are you creating for the next generation? Are you creating good habits for your children? You know, a bad habit, a good habit for your children is they're in church every week. You know, sometimes you grow, if you've grown up not in a Christian family, you say, oh, you know, I wish I grew up in a Christian family. What does that mean, to grow up in a Christian family? Well, it means that you had good Christian habits. You, know, you prayed as a family. You came to church on Sunday. You made sure your, church, your family was at church on Sunday. You know, and this is why it's so important that these habits, you know, the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he shall not depart from it. What does this training mean? Training doesn't just mean you're just telling them, you're just telling them what they should do, what they should do. You know, training them is also leading by example. You say, hey, this is, what we, this is how we do it. This is what we're going to do. So our example, we want to instill good habits into the next generation. This is why, you know, it's important to be in church. It's important to, you know, praise. You know, there's only one place you can, you know, like the Psalm 22 says, in the midst of the congregation will I sing praise unto thee. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Well, there's one place to do that, 
right? When you come and gather with the church and then sing praises to God. So church is important. It's the example that we set. Are you setting a good example? Do you set a good example in the way you behave yourself at church? You know, when it's time to sing, do you sing? You know, sometimes in churches, and you see it all around the place, for some reason Christians think the time of singing is a time to get a coffee. Time to sing, it's the time to use the bathroom. Time for singing, it's the time to check your social media. You know, you're just sitting there not singing, right? Well, what sort of example are you setting to the next generation? You want the children to come to church and sing praises to God? They're going to look at the adults and they say, well, the adults are not singing praises to God, right? So let's set a good example. Let's set a good example in, in how we sing. What about in service? You know, do you treat church as just a spiritual checkbox? You know, when you come to church, yeah, I was there, I've left, I've done the church thing. Well, church is more than that. You know, that's why church is about service as well. Like, how are you getting involved in church? Do you help out at church? You know, that's the sort of example you want to set. You know, you want to be passionate about the things of God. What about being consistent? You know, these are the sort of habits we're going to instill in our children by our example. Are we passionate about the things that we believe? You know, are you passionate about the things of God? Are you consistent you know, do you just come to church once every couple of months? Are you there every week? Are you consistent? Is it part of your schedule? Are you on time? You know, you come early to church so that you're on time. Are you ready to sing and to listen? You know, a good habit to get into, you know, use the bathroom before church. You know, so you don't have to go during the songs. <laughs> right, or during these other. Now, don't use social media at church. You know, when you're at church, you shouldn't be on social media, you know, and, and especially during the preaching, or during the songs. You know, that's going to be a bad habit that's going to go into other generations. You know, when you're sitting at church and you're just on social media, you know, we come to church to meet one another. We come to church to interact with one another. And sometimes people come to church and they just, you know, on their phone, you know, just playing games on their phone, just checking their social media when there's people here to talk to. You know, you're so worried about who's commenting on your social media. Why not talk to somebody here? You know, and get some real interaction. You know, let's not have, let's not create those bad habits for our children either. So, good. Your example is important, right? And the example is what people see, and that's what's going to our children are going to copy, right? So that's another reason why church is important. Right? We want to set a good example for the next generation. We want them to grow up. You know, I want my kids to grow up just knowing that that's what they do on Sunday. And, you know, I have faith in God's word that if I train up my children in the way they should go, they won't depart from it. So that when they grow up, you know, like, like we talked about with the first point, that having a pure conscience is, is an underrated thing. But I want my children to know, like, this is what's expected from them. So when they grow up, they may just have that inherent conscience of, hey, you know, I should be at church on Sunday. You know, that's going to keep them on the right path. All right, number three, the importance of church is you get a reminder. A reminder every week. You know, you're reminded, you know, why we live on this earth. You're reminded what's important. You know, it's because you, you live your life and you get busy and you forget. You know, we're a very forgetful people. So church is a good reminder. Not only are you learning as a new believer or as an old believer, but as an older believer, you're constantly reminded of the same things. Second Peter 1. Wherefore, this is Peter here, wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. So not only, you know, at church, you come and you're reminded, but sometimes you have to be reminded to be reminded. You know, you have to remember that we have to remember, because we constantly forget. And one reason why it's so easy to forget is because we don't do the things that we learn. 
Right? James 1.22, but be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass, for he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. You know, that's often the main reason why we forget things in the Christian life, because we don't do them. If you don't put them into practice, then you forget them. Like the Bible says here, if you look into the perfect law of liberty, and you don't continue therein, you're going to be a forgetful hearer. Right? So you want to be a doer of the work, and then this man shall be blessed in his deed. So it's not always the case that we, we don't know. Right? It's, just, it's not at the forefront of our mind. You know, so it's not always that you forget and you're like, oh, I don't even remember like, who's Jesus Christ. I don't even remember who he is. Like, you know who he is. You know these things, but it's not at the forefront of your mind. So this is why it's important. Well, when the Bible talks about having it in remembrance and remembering things, it's not that you don't know about them. It's that you go about your day not really thinking about them, not meditating on these things. And when you come to church, you're reminded. That's why church is important. And you can tell, like if you haven't been in church for a long time, you start to just think more about the things of the world than of the things of God. And then when you come to church, you reflect on the things again. You think, yeah, you know, remember, that's what life should be about. That's what I should be living for. You know, and, and that weekly reminder is good. It's good for you. Why? Because we're such a forgetful people. This is why God gives ordinances in the Bible in order to remember things. He did it in the Old Testament. Here's two examples in the Old Testament. Exodus 12, the Passover was an example. And it shall come to pass when ye be come to the land which the Lord will give you, according as he hath promised, that ye shall keep this service. What was the service? This was the, the slaying of the Passover lamb, you know, and then the eating together. They did this every year. You know, maybe every year it just became this tradition. It had a meaning to it, right? And what was the meaning? It was to remind them and also to teach their children. And look at this in verse 26. And it shall come to pass... When your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? That ye shall say, It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt, when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses, and the people bowed the head and worshipped. Right? So it's like the children might ask, You know, why do we go to church every week? Well, you've got to explain to them. Well, we come to church every week because Jesus Christ died and rose again for us. We're meeting in his name. We're kind of come and we worship and learn from his word and, and get encouraged, exhorted to serve him, right? So there's a, there's a reason why we have these regular things in the Christian life. It's to remind us. So here, the Passover, you know, even God, you know, he had in mind when he created the Passover that it was to teach the next generation, to teach the children, to keep it in remembrance. Look at Joshua 4. This is when they pass over the uh, Jordan River into the Promised Land. And uh, you think uh, Moses was the only one that you know, split the water. Everyone knows that you know, Moses parted the Red Sea. But you know there were two other instances in the Bible where waters parted. One of them is here, when Joshua parts you know, the Jordan River and the, the Ark of the Covenant of God like, walks through on dry land. And then the other one is you know, when Elijah and Elisha part the water you know, um, as a miracle as well. Joshua 4, Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan. Take ye, upon, take ye up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according unto the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. That this may be a sign among you when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? So what did they do? All right? Verse 7, Then ye shall answer them, that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it passed over Jordan. The waters of Jordan were cut off and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. So when they passed over the Jordan River, they went and got 12 stones and they put stone, these big rocks, where they passed over. So that why in time to come, they'll say, why, why are these stones by the river? And they say, well, because that's where... The Ark of the Covenant passed over the Jordan River. Right? Why was it there? For a memorial. It was to remember these things. Why? Because we so easily 
forget, don't we? Now notice here, doesn't this tie into Ephesians 6 where it says fathers, you know, teach children? Fathers, and ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Right? So, this may be a sign among you, look at this, that when your children asked their fathers in time to come. It wasn't when children asked their mothers in time to come. Right? But a lot of times, you know, mothers take up the spiritual teaching and responsibility in their house. But who should be responsible for reminding the family, reminding the children of why to do things? It's the fathers. That, that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, what mean ye by these stones? Then ye shall answer. Okay, so we come to church to learn. We come to church as a reminder. Even when we take of the communion, we read this all the time. For I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. See, so even in the New Testament, we don't have these Old Testament. You know, we don't have um, the Passover anymore. But there's that similar, you know, the fact that God has given us these ordinances to remember because we are a forgetful people. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Right? So we're showing the Lord's death to our children. So when they ask, why do we break bread? You know, why do we drink of the cup? Are you fathers ready to explain, right? And lead by example. All right, so it's a reminder. The last one I want to talk about. last one I want to talk about is the importance of church is community. Community. Right, we saw there in Hebrews 10 verse 24, it said, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Right, so part of the reason why we gather together, it's not just about learning, it's not just about setting a good example, right? but it's also coming here to be a blessing and to encourage each, each other to serve God. Right? Let us consider one another that means you think about one another, to provoke unto love and to good works. Right? So that's one reason why it's important to come to church. You come to church to be encouraged, to serve, but also you come to church to encourage others to serve as well. Proverbs 27, verse 17. So we're talking about community here, being part of this body, being part of this group of people. Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. So a lot of people use this verse to talk about, you know, iron sharpening iron, talk about discussing things, learning from one another. But you've got to remember, you know, when iron sharpens iron, sometimes it requires a bit of friction, right? Sometimes you're going to rub people the wrong way. You know, but that's also growing as well. You know, when you rub people the wrong way, you overcome that, you make up, you get stronger, the bonds grow stronger, and you're constantly sharpening, right? So sharpening requires a bit of friction, right? It requires a bit of resistance. You know, that's why sometimes conversations, you know, you, well, you like robust conversations are good. Right? When you talk about spiritual things, you might disagree and go back and forth, and then you're both growing from it. So it is a good analogy, iron sharpening iron, when you discuss things. But I also like to think of this as, you know, relationship building as well. And sometimes, you know, you've got to be willing to kind of, you know, rub each other the wrong way to get to know each other. Right? Get to know each other better and open up. So community. Matthew 7. Matthew 7. See, the one, one big thing I want to sort of talk about today about community is, is accountability. Right? So it's not just a community being like a social group where you come and you chit-chat and you have fun. And these are all great things as well. One of the important things about being part of a church and being part of a community is accountability. What I mean by that, it keeps you on the right path. Like when you're not living right, 
there's some accountability there that people now know. Like when you when you skip church, you know, if you're rooted and you're you know sort of planted in this church and you build some relationships and people know you, then they notice that when you're gone. You know, they notice, oh, well, who, where is this person? Where is that person? They haven't been at church. I haven't seen them. And sometimes we think of that as a negative thing. We think like, oh, you know, uh, you know, if I do this or I do that or I'm missing church, everyone's talking about me. Well, you know, whether, whether it's a bad thing or a good thing it comes down to the attitude in which people are taking care of you, right? Because that is one of the good things of church. You know, that's one of the normal things of church is that when you, when, when you are thinking about doing something that people might find out about, you're thinking, oh, like, what will people at church say? You know, can I face the people at church if I do this? Right? If I do this, you know, like, what are, what are the people I know going to say? That, that sort of community accountability is a good thing, right? Now, I'm not always saying that every church community and every group always goes about it the right way, right? But I'm saying that that is a real thing that God wants in a church to consider one another and to take care of one another and to hold each other accountable. So then when somebody goes off the wrong path, there's, there's a way that they're brought back. There's a way, there's that other thought where they think, you know, because sometimes, you know, sometimes God knowing everything and God being everywhere, you know, requires a bit too much faith for us, right? Because sometimes we, we get it, we go about wrong things, even though knowing that God is everywhere, knowing that God hears everything you say and sees everything you watch and knows everything you do isn't always enough, right? But sometimes physical people, you know, it can also help us as well, right? When you know, hey, I've got an example to set. You know, I've got people that I know. Because it's going to keep you on track, right? Keep you from doing something silly in your life, right? Or posting something silly on social media, right? Matthew 7, verse 1. Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye. Well, how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite. So some people, they stop at verse 4, and they say, oh, you know, don't, don't, don't worry about other people's problems. You know, just remove the beam from your own eye. But that's not where the, that's not where the passage stops. Right? This passage doesn't stop at verse 1. It doesn't stop at judge not. No, it's saying, don't be a hypocrite when you judge. And then when you judge, make sure, you know, how, do you, how are you not a hypocrite? Well, don't look at your brother's moat in their eye and don't even consider their beam that is in your own eye. But it doesn't stop at that either, right? It says, thou hypocrite, verse 5, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, look at this, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. Right? So you see that, that there is a responsibility on the Christian to help others stay on the right path as well. Right? So this is where you know, we all have to realize that this is all our responsibility. This is not just Victor's responsibility. Right? People say, like, oh, yeah, that's, that's the bishop's responsibility to go around keeping everybody accountable. And that's, that's not always easy in and of itself either because I don't always know what's going on. You know, oftentimes the bishop is the last one to know. You know, once, some, once a, something's been festering and then it, it gets really big, then I find out. And then I have to go figure out, like, well, okay, what happened there? Well, I haven't seen everyone and try and smooth things over. Or, you know, you know I just don't see anyone anymore. And then I realize some, somebody, somebody's uh, upset. Now, what we have to take to heart here is, you know, being accountable to one another is, is everyone's responsibility in church. You know, if you see, if you know somebody, as you build relationships with one another, you know, and you, and you build friendships and close relationships, when you see a moat in your brother's eye, obviously you don't want to be a hypocrite, you know, you want to have some, you know, internal consideration first and look at yourself first and say, hey, you know, am I, am I walking right with God? Am I doing this out of the right motive? You know, sometimes, you know, you have people in church that just want to go around correcting everyone because it makes them feel superior. You know, so you need some sort of introspection first where you think, am I doing this? Am I taking heed to myself? Am I considering myself first? And then you'll see clearly to cast out the moat out of your brother's eye. 
So I don't think this is just referring to seeing clearly what their problem is. I think it's also having the right attitude and the right mindset so that when you go and help somebody else, you're doing it out of love and not out of the wrong attitude. Right? Galatians 6.1, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. And so another reason why it's important to be in church is that accountability. And that should not be understated. I think, you know, a lot of problems in people's lives can be avoided because they were rooted into church. And, you know, I think you can only really take advantage, I don't know if that's the right word, but you maybe benefit from accountability in church if you're planted in church. Like, if, 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 you're, if you're somebody that comes, you know, just every now and then, and then nobody really knows you, nobody really knows what you get up to in your life, then there's really no accountability there, is there? Because nobody really knows you that well. So one way you can really benefit from this accountability in church is that you, you, you build relationships in church. You, what does that mean? You get to know people. People know who you are. People know what you do. People know what you get up to. And then that way, there's that accountability there. And then that way, it'll keep you on the right path. You know, I'm sure, like in, in, in churches all around the world, you know, many marriages stay together because of church, right? And, you know, many people don't do silly things in life because of church. Because what if somebody finds out? And that's, that's a good thing. Right? It's a good thing to think, gosh, like if I do this, what if somebody finds out? What's that ripple effect? Right? Because that means you're considering other people. You're considering the choices that you make in your life. How is it going to affect the church? How is it going to affect the relationships in church? How is it going to affect your reputation and your family and all that? So you should be considering those things as you live your life. And this is how the church community breeds that environment of accountability. So church is a command, right? And if you are in church, I think it will help your spiritual growth. Not only that, but it will help you have a pure heart before God. It's going to help your example. Right? You're going to be a good example to the next generation. You're constantly, when you come to church every week, you're reminded about what life should be about. And number four, you're part of a community, and that community will keep you accountable, right? Keep you on the right path. Last, last thought I want to leave you with is in 1 Corinthians 12. And this is what I was, the verse that the children looked at this morning. 1 Corinthians 12. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. So church is important. And we talked about the reasons why church is important. But the thought I want to leave you with is, you are the church. You are the church. So what sort of church do you want? You know, people say, like, oh, I wish I had a church like this. I wish church was like this. Oh, you know, this, that you go visit a church. And you say, oh, that church was so friendly. But what, what, do you, what do you think about what do you mean by that? You say you went to this church, you had a few interactions with some of the members, and then you walked away saying that church was so friendly. You know, or you, or you go to that church, oh, that church was so clean. You know, or this church, you know, the church was so, you know, whatever, right? These, you know, they, when I went there, church was very respectful. Oh, they, that church, oh, that church sung really loud. They were really passionate when they were singing for God. Who is the church? So, it's like they say in life, you know, be the change you want to see in the world. So I'm trying to play on that right now. You know, you are the church. What sort of church do you want? And the sort of church you want, you should be that. Why? Because you are the church. So always remember that. Don't think the church is somebody else. The church is you. Like you are the church. So be the sort of church that you want. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for the reminder. Um, Lord, thank you for the reminder for all of us. And uh, we just pray, Lord, that you help us to, to be the church that you want us to be. We pray, Lord, that we'll be a godly church, be a passionate church, you know, a church that's consistent, a church that is loving, a church that is friendly, a church that is serving, a soul-winning church. Lord, help us to be the sort of church that you want us to be. 
And uh, we pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.